the holy gospel of our lord jesus christ according to matthew Glory Glory to you, lord christ once more jesus spoke to them in parables saying the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son he sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet but they would not come again he sent other slaves saying tell those who have been invited look i have prepared my dinner my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready come to the wedding banquet but they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But the king came in to see the guest. He noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him out into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come my way, by truth, my life. Such a way as gives us breath. Such a truth as ends all strife. Such a life as killeth death. Come my joy, my love, my heart. Such a joy as none can move, such a love as none can part, such a heart as joys in love. George Herbert wrote those words a long, long time ago, and they are for us a guide and in many ways a signpost of where we would be today, but truly we are not. I, like you, have been subject to news feeds that continue to to lambast us and provoke us with images of the violence in the Middle East. And would that that were the only war being waged and war that rages around us as a human race, but there are so many more. Wars that are being paid attention to like Ukraine, wars that are silent like those in Central America and in South America and in the East, and even in our own hearts and minds. The battles we fight sometimes have blood, but often always have a form of rhetoric that teaches us to objectify, to dehumanize, to other the human being across the divide from us. And we forget that we are called as children of God, whatever form or shape being a people of the book means, be it Judaism or Islam or Christianity, we are called to recognize that our God is a loving God. Come my way, my truth, my life. The gift, the giver and gift of love is something that we all know and yearn for, and yet we can too easily forget. More so the human institutions and nations that comprise our human society too easily can fall into conflict. And though we may intend to work together toward a common good, toward peace, 
we can so easily be disarmed and disengaged from that as to render even our common work torn and riven by conflict. It is not really my picture to share. And I realized I should have asked permission from the Sunday school to do so. So I'm not going to share it, but I asked them to draw today's parable and to do it together. They didn't do well. They argued over the composition of the picture. They argued over its, its construction and execution. And then when particular members of the group were given particular tasks, others weighed in because they thought that they could do it better. There was a lot of conflict. But they acknowledged at the end of that, that there was conflict, that they were supposed to have shared the task. And yet, and we can acknowledge this, how impossible it is to agree on just how red and what direction a laser eye should go between the king and the man who shows up with no wedding garment, the laser eyes of rage. Easy to conceive, difficult to execute. And yet we know so well what that gaze of outrage really is comprised of. And it's not laser beams. It's our own broken intentions, our own conflicts and traumas, our own struggles for meaning in a world that is so challenging that we should turn to God as David did and said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Even in green pastures, I remember the agonies that I have faced and that God's hand was upon me and with me throughout. That we should acknowledge as the prophet Isaiah does, the brokenness that war and trauma and displacement brings and yearn for a mountainside where God provides a table of good food, of the best pot roast and the finest bottle of red wine strained clear and decanted and viands and dishes from our childhood that should remind us that we are once one upon a time, once upon a time, we were once whole and we were once complete. And even in the most peaceful and beautiful place, we have to acknowledge that we still carry wounds and scars and every joy is bittersweet. This is the human condition. I wish that the events of the past week in the Holy Land had been surprises to us, but we have to acknowledge they are not. And we also have to acknowledge that this is one of those conflicts where there isn't really a side to choose other than sorrow and grief over violence and depredation in any form and a hope and sincerity that we as a human race in every place where we are broken and torn by strife, where the night sky is illuminated by tracers and explosions, where avenues of safe conduct are peppered with shells and bombs, we must acknowledge that we are still a broken people yearning for God's grace and peace. And we must acknowledge that we are poor smiths at the forge where that tool of grace should be constructed. And we have to start learning some new skills. I deeply appreciate Paul's letter to the Philippians as he tries to enjoin them to the work of Christ. And in the midst of this, he turns to two sisters in Christ and says, I urge that Euodia and Syntyche should be reconciled to each other. We don't know what they were arguing about. They met business partners and they are disagreeing over something. They were maybe sisters who were conflicting with each other from the womb. They have, may have been friends and a broken promise or a broken trust led to a division that was so remarkable that Paul should remind us of it to this day. But he enjoins them to strive for reconciliation, whether it is an interpersonal conflict or a global conflict or an internecine conflict 
and understand that in whatever scale we are experiencing those struggles, we should be striving for justice and peace. So that the peace which passes all understanding may not only abide in us, but may become a gift that we can give to the world. That is the profundity of the sorrow that we feel. The women's breakfast yesterday, I asked them to speak to the war. And the moment we started to do so, we didn't just start with the war that was experienced, that the world is experiencing now. Instead, we went back to World War II. The earliest memories of one of our members of the breakfast said, I remember that. I had family fighting then. And then others told stories of Korea, of Vietnam, the first and the second Gulf Wars. And one young person at the women's breakfast confessed that throughout her entire life, she could barely remember a time when the United States wasn't at war. And we must acknowledge that war is not far off for any of us anymore as a human race. Instead, it is very near. And if it is that near to us, then it is also incumbent upon us to figure out ways that we can work together and labor for peace, to join each other at the forge of justice with the anvil of hope and the hammer of truth in our hands and seek to forge the tools we need to build the grace and peace that should pass all understanding and instead tend to cloud our judgments and obscure our sight and occlude our heart because we are distracted by violence, by rhetoric, by lost intentions. It should be a simple thing to draw a picture of a parable but we must confess that if I was gonna give them a parable, this one really stunk. <laughs> but we cannot afford to turn our eyes from it. When Jesus tells us that the kingdom of heaven is like a king who has a wedding banquet and sends his servants out to gather them in and all of them reject the invitation and instead choose to ignore and ridicule and even abuse the ones who are inviting them to the feast, and instead invites others and someone shows up and doesn't observe the dress code, which of course is Episcopalians we know is a cardinal sin. <laughs> I had to lighten it a little bit because I've been really heavy all this time. That we should acknowledge that if the kingdom of heaven is something we are called upon to celebrate and bring in in this life, this parable is a lot more accurate than some of the others that are being represented. We have to acknowledge that we, like the king, sometimes fail to see the intention of the guest who doesn't show up with the right garment on. And we, as the people of God, have to do better at being agents and provocateurs of peace. I appreciate the gift and the provocation that this conflict is giving us. I appreciate the gift that the conflict in the Sunday school brings to you to see with new eyes how we might be agents of that peace which passes understanding. And perhaps like Euodia and Sintike, we might find it within ourselves to be reconciled to each other, whatever our conflicts may be. And perhaps we can continue to do whatever is good and just and pure as Paul enjoins the Philippians. Perhaps then we will have peace. Amen.